This is uh, English 101, week six, part two. Okay, so let's pick it up. Um, all right, so for Socrates, and they used to believe this, by the way, for hundreds and hundreds of years, that love was like literally like physical particles would sort of enter into the eye and, and sort of get into your brain. And, and you see somebody beautiful and, and, and sort of, because when you see somebody beautiful, it's coming into your eye. And that's how they thought love would kind of go in through your eye and like enter into your body and make you fall in love. You could sort of catch love if you saw somebody. We, we still use the phrase, catch, you caught feelings. Um, uh, but it's, it's an idea Socrates is describing here, this idea that the, um, that, that particles flow towards you and emotion comes into your, comes into your eyes, hits your soul and gets it sort of excited to grow wings. Um, because it want, because love is one of, it's reaching toward higher heavenly things. Notice by the way, something interesting here. Um, usually when we think about love, we think about when you are in love, you want to go toward the person. Um, Socrates says when you are in love, your soul doesn't want to go to the person. It wants to go up to higher heavenly things. That those two directions, that's the good horse and the bad horse. See, the good horse wants to go up to higher heavenly things, and the bad horse wants to like just fuck that person. So this is this is this is the so this is Socrates's idea. Right, let's keep. I think I've already. We're gonna get there. All right, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I'm excited. I'm having a good time. All right. So, um, but when she is parted from her beloved and her moisture fails, then the orifices and passage out of which the wings sh wings shoot up, dry up and close. Um, and intercept the germ of the wing, which being shut up with the emotion, throbbing into the pulsations of an artery, pricks the aperture which is nearest, until at length the entire soul is pierced and maddened and pained, and at the recollection of beauty is again delighted. Um, the, the idea is really simple, that when you're in love and you see somebody beautiful, they send things, emotions or whatever, into your eyes. Beauty and emotion goes into your body and makes your soul get excited and grow wings. But when that person leaves you, if they're like, oh shit, I gotta go on vacation, I'll see you in a week and a half. Then, and, and you feel you feel hurt, you miss them so bad, it hurts. Socrates says, what is that hurt? It's your soul was growing wings and then it had to stop suddenly. That's very painful because it hasn't, the wings haven't gotten all the way out uh, into, into proper flying mode. They're sort of stopped halfway, just like if your teeth stopped halfway when they were coming down, it's painful. So that's, again, it's a crazy mythology explanation of a very simple thing that everybody experiences, which when you fall in love, you want to be with that person. And if you can't be with that person, it hurts. Why does it hurt? Well, Socrates says the reason why it hurts not to be around them is because your soul is growing wings. And if you stop halfway, that's painful. Okay, cool. This is going good. Um, uh, okay, cool. Um, all right. Sorry, I lost where I was. I'm going to find it. Um, and from both of them together, the soul is oppressed at the strangeness of her condition and is in a great strait and excitement um, because it's stressed out because it wants to be with that person. And in her madness can neither sleep by night nor abide by her place in day because your soul is when you're in love. You can't concentrate on anything. You can't sleep. You can't get your work done because you want that beauty and that love to grow the wings of your soul so it can sort of go up to heavenly things. And whenever she, and by the way, it's interesting that she, the word she, this, um, I, I, I talked earlier about how um, in Socrates' day, what they're really talking about is love between two men, sort of a, a sort of sexual romantic attraction between an older man and a younger man. And, and the younger man probably would not have been 18 years old. So that opens up a whole other complicated thing that is not really something we're going to discuss here. I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Uh, I'm going to leave that for an ancient Greek historian to handle. We don't need to get into that for the purposes of this class, but um, it, is, it, is, it is worth knowing that that was what they're talking about back then. Um, uh, the reason I mention it is it's interesting because now suddenly you see the word her. Um, it's not, they're not talking about a woman. They, the idea is that the soul is female, which is interesting. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I just said it. I don't know why. I should, probably shouldn't have said that. I should have moved on to something else, but anyway. Um, it's interesting that the word soul is female when we're talking about men in love. Um, and wherever she thinks that she will behold the beautiful one, thither in her desire she runs. So the soul wants to be with the beautiful person and chases after them. And when she has seen him and bathed herself in the waters of beauty, her constraint is loosened and she is refreshed and has no more pangs and pains. And this is the sweetest of all pleasures at the time and is the reason why the soul of the lover will never forsake his beautiful one, whom he esteems above all. He has forgotten mother and brethren and companions 
and he thinks of nothing, he thinks nothing of the neglect and loss of his property, the rules and properties of life on which he formerly prided himself, he now despises, and is ready to sleep like a servant wherever he is allowed, as near as he can be to the desired one, who is the object of his worship, and the physician who can alone assuage the greatness of his pain. Um, That the, the, the other person is, is like a doctor who can make you feel better, uh, make your pain go away. Um, because when you're in love, being near the other person, seeing them makes you feel good. But when you're away from them, you feel pain. And so, they're, so so going to the person you love to spend time with them is like going to the doctor because when you're not around them and you're in pain, and when you get around them, you're not in pain anymore because your soul is being refreshed and getting those good love feelings. Um, uh, yeah. And reaching towards higher heavenly things. This is the crucial bit for Socrates. It's, this is not, he's not talking about sex. Um, this, for most people, love and sex are kind of pretty closely connected ideas. But for Socrates, the soul is not thinking about sex. The soul is remembering something about the heavenly world that it used to come from. And the person, the beautiful person, reminds them of that upper, higher, heavenly world. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very hard to teach. Sometimes I feel like when I teach this, I come across as anti-sex because Plato's pretty anti-sex. And I think this is extremely interesting, but I am not anti-sex. Um, and I, it's, it's tricky to teach. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. I haven't found. Um, okay. So let's see what else. Um, right. And you want to be near the person all the time, even if it's like sleep on the ground. And this state, my dear imaginary youth to whom I am talking, because he's, he's sort of imagining who he, he's giving this big speech to somebody, but you know, he, it's Phaedrus really, um, but he's being kind of cute here, um, is by men called love and among the gods has a name at which you and your simplicity may be inclined to mock. People make fun of love all the time. I think it's stupid. There are two lines in the apocryphal writings of Homer in which the name occurs. One of them is rather outrageous and not altogether metrical. He's talking about poetry. Here. Um, Mortals call him fluttering love, but the immortals call him winged one, because the growing of wings is a necessity to him. So again, this is Cupid, right? I mentioned this earlier. This is the go- people make fun of Cupid, the sort of god of love who shoots people with bow and arrows and makes them fall in love. Um, you may believe this, but not unless you like. At any rate, the loves of lovers and their causes are such as I have described. So, I mean, a little conclusion there. Um, I want to say something. Cupid, sometimes um, you see Cupid with a blindfold. Um it's a little, the little baby, that it's a, it's a mythology thing from ancient Greek and Roman mythology, the little baby uh, with wings, the little angel baby who shoots you with arrows. It's Venus's son, because Venus is the goddess of love. Um, Aphrodite is her other name. Um, shoots you with arrows. Um, I mentioned blindfolded. Um, there are two reasons for the baby to be blindfolded. They're very different reasons. They're from different centuries. Um, in one century, the baby was blindfolded because love was irrational. You would fall in love with somebody. It's like like falling in love is like a kid shooting an arrow with a blindfold. You don't know who you're going to hit. You don't know who you're going to fall in love with. Um, but for Socrates and Plato, um, love is blindfolded because actually love doesn't have anything to do with that good looking person in front of you. Love doesn't need sight. Love has, love is really a mental thing. Um, and it's, and, and the, the good horse and the soul are trying to get up to that mental world where you don't need your eyes um, because it's all about thoughts and emotions and not about physical bodies at all. Um, okay, cool. This is going really good. All right. I'm liking this. We're doing it. We're going to, we're going to get through this. This is going to be great. I'm having fun. All right, let's take a look. Okay. So he's now, now he goes into some wacky mythology stuff and I'm going to zip through some of this, but let's, let's get started on it here. Um, Cool. Now, the lover who is taken to be the attendant of Zeus is better able to bear the winged god and can endure a heavier burden. But the attendants and companions of Ares, Ares is like the god of war, when under the influence of love. If they fancy they have been at all wrong, they are ready to kill and put an end to themselves and their beloved. And he who follows in the train of any other god while he is unspoiled and the impression lasts, honors and imitates him as far as he is able. And after the manner of his god, he behaves in his intercourse, that's like his discussion, with his beloved like the rest of the world during the first period of his earthly existence. Um, this is, this is a, I'm not doing this. This is astrology shit. Um, this is the idea that if you are born under an astrological sign, you have a certain kind of personality. So some people are more warlike and angry, and some people are more soft. And Socrates has this idea that being born under, your, if your soul was originally part of this god or that god or this god's group or that god's group, that you come out different. Not going to spend a lot of time on that because I don't think astrology is a super useful way of looking at the world. Um, but some of my students are into astrology. Please do not write about astrology in your papers because uh, it is not the kind of thing you can write about in an academic paper because it's, I don't know how to say why you can't, but you basically just can't. 
uh, if you really want to, you can talk to me and we'll figure it out. All right, I'll see you in the next video.